Services. Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. At question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by putting on record the best wishes of, I'm sure, the whole Chamber and people across Scotland to His Majesty the King and the Duchess of Rossi. We wish them both a speedy recovery to good health. <laughs> Last week, in response to the Horizon scandal, the First Minister said this. I think the idea of almost a mass exoneration is one that is very worthy of consideration. And in a letter to the Prime Minister just eight days ago, he said, and I quote, it is right that normal processes for appeals are set aside. But in a statement this week, the Lord Advocate, his government's top legal adviser said, and I quote, in Scotland, there is an established route of appeal in circumstances like this. So Hamza Youssef has said that there should be a blanket exoneration, but the Lord Advocate believes that the current process for appeals shouldn't change with each case being considered individually. So can the First Minister tell not just Parliament, but crucially all the victims of this scandal what the position of his government actually is. First Minister. Can I thank uh, Douglas Ross uh, for the question? Can I also associate myself with the remarks and wish a speedy recovery to both uh, King Charles and, of course, the Duchess uh, of Rothsey uh, too. Uh, in relation uh, to uh, this issue, let's first and foremost begin by paying tribute once again, not just to Alan Bates, but to those hundreds of sub-postmasters and mistresses right across the United Kingdom that should not have had to wait for an ITV drama in order to see justice or indeed in order to see compensation. But, of course, it is important that the UK government has acted. Uh, Douglas Ross is right. I wrote to the Prime Minister. I should say I've received a response back from the Prime Minister. The response is a positive one, that he is willing to work on a UK-wide uh, basis. I'm, I, I should say, happy to release uh, that response, though I think we're waiting for a number 10 to confirm that they're also happy for us uh, to do so. But that detail in that response uh, does say that the UK government are willing to work with the Scottish government in order to look at a UK-wide basis for uh, mass exoneration for those who have been wrongfully convicted. I listened very carefully uh, to what Laura Advocate had to say, both in her statement and indeed in response uh, to questions. She was making the point, of course, that there is a current appeals uh, process uh, through the Scottish Criminal Case Review Commission uh, as well in order to investigate uh, mass uh, miscarriages of justice. But let me just be clear, so Douglas Ross uh, has no misunderstanding. Uh, we support the UK government looking at legislation for mass exoneration of those who are wrongfully convicted. And we've written to the UK government, got a positive response back, and we hope that the legislation can apply on a UK-wide basis. Douglas Ross. Well, well, that doesn't actually clear up uh, the case here in Scotland. Well, the First Minister says it does. But of course, the UK legislation it will apply in England and Wales, but this issue is devolved here in Scotland. And we have his top legal officer who sits in the Scottish Government Cabinet saying something quite different to the First Minister. Let me quote again from the Lord Advocate on Tuesday. It's an important process because not every case involving horizon evidence will be a miscarriage of justice and each case must be considered carefully. That's the Lord Advocate's current position. So what that is, is a refusal to change the process and accelerate the system because there may be some guilty people. Surely it's better to accept the tiny possibility that a guilty person will have their conviction overturned than allowing dozens of innocent postmasters to live with the stain of guilt for a minute longer. So can I ask the First Minister, what discussions has he had with the Lord Advocate since her statement on Tuesday, and does he agree that these convictions must be quashed as quickly as possible? First Minister. The, the Lord Advocate and I are due uh, to speak again uh, tomorrow, I believe. Uh, but what I would say to Douglas Ross is that Lord Advocate, uh, when she was speaking in the Chamber, of course, was speaking as the independent head of prosecutions. Uh, that is an important uh, part of uh, her function, which is distinct, of course, to her position when she provides uh, legal advice uh, as a member of uh, this government. It's still my preference, I should say, that there is <coughs> the UK-wide basis, uh, UK-wide legislation, <coughs> as UK legislation is applied on, on a UK-wide basis through an LCM. I think that would be the preferable route. Now, there are complexities to work uh, through there. I think the, the choice that Douglas Ross is presenting as a binary choice is, is not the correct one. The best position for all of us is urgently seeing the mass exoneration 
for those who were wrongfully convicted, and of course for those whose conviction was sound and is sound, nobody wants to see necessarily their conviction overturned and then being able to apply for compensation. So if we can get the, be the best of uh, both worlds, if we can get to that position, that is the best uh, position to get to. And that is why we're willing to work with the UK government who presumably also don't want sound convictions overturned if they can avoid that, we will work with the UK government in that respect. But let's not forget about what we are dealing here. This, I'm afraid, is a scandal that was born in Westminster. This is a post office that is wholly reserved, wholly responsible to UK government ministers. I accept, lied to UK government ministers. Briefly, First Minister. The UK government clearly did not interrogate the post office uh, strongly uh, enough, and therefore the public inquiry is important, and I would urge the UK government to make sure they fully co uh, cooperate with that public inquiry. Yeah, yeah. Douglas Ross. The Crown Office is wholly devolved here in Scotland. That's why the situation is very different here. The Post Office could not prosecute uh, these individuals here. It was the Crown Office. Uh, one of those who was prosecuted it was Judith Smith. She pled guilty in 2009 at Selkirk Sheriff Court to a charge of fraud after thousands of pounds disappeared. Judith's lawyer told us that the Crown Office displayed a worrying lack of scepticism at the Post Office's case, particularly as there was no trace of the money anywhere. Judith was even asked if she'd blown it all on a lavish holiday or if she had a gambling problem. Her conviction was finally quashed just last week. But Judith's lawyer said the Crown Office should have launched a review of all past Post Office prosecutions the minute it became aware of the Horizon problem in 2013. They didn't, and it took a further two years for prosecutors to dismiss ongoing cases that relied on Horizon evidence. So can the First Minister explain why prosecutions in Scotland continued for two more years after the Crown Office became aware of concerns with Horizon? And does the First Minister agree with the Scottish Conservative calls that the, the Lord Advocate at the time, Frank Mulholland, should come to this Parliament to answer questions on this scandal? First Minister. Uh, first of all, uh, can we be clear? What it took was an ITV drama in order to get the UK government to make sure that they took action, even though they were being told by hundreds of sub-postmasters and mistresses up and down the country that they had been lied to. So let's not forget that is what spurred the UK government into action, not the pleas and the desperate pleas of sub-postmasters right up and down the country. And let's go back to the point, of course, that the Lord Advocate made, I think very clearly, in this chamber, that the Crown was, in her words, I believe, uh, misled and, not, and given false reassurances by the UK Post Office, time and time and time again. And I have to say, hearing the harrowing testimonies, including, of course, the one uh, from Judith uh, that, that, that Douglas Ross uh, just articulated, uh, there are many uh, institutions that will be answerable for what they did and the action that they took. And I would fully expect, and I'm certain it will be the case, that the Crown Office would also, uh, of course, fully cooperate with the public inquiry uh, underway. In terms of why the Crown chose to prosecute cases post-2013, again, the Lord Advocate laid that out, laid out the fact that, of course, there was guidance to prosecutors in 2013 involving Horizon uh, cases. And, of course, then they stopped prosecuting cases in 2015 that were sufficiently dependent on Horizon data. In terms of Lord Advocate, of course, the current Lord Advocate is responsible and answerable for the Crown. Of course, she has, answer, has already answered questions about what took place uh, in 2013, and, uh, and she has already said if MSPs want a further opportunity to question her, then she will make herself available. Douglas Ross. Of course, my question was about one of her predecessors, and I think it is crucial uh, that this Parliament hears from Frank Mulholland, and it would just be interesting to know if the First Minister uh, supports those Scottish Conservative calls. Because all of this matters here in Holyrood because the Crown Office is a devolved institution. The procedure by which these convictions can be quashed will be set by this Government and this Parliament. But the process set out by the Lord Advocate could see that taking far, far longer in Scotland than it should. Myra Philp worked with her mum Mary at the post office in Ochtermachty in 2001. At 7am one morning, post office auditors burst through the door and demanded the keys to the shop. 
Mary, a former policewoman, was suspended, but she immediately suspected Horizon was to blame. The post office, on the other hand, blamed her teenage grandchildren. Auditors accused them of breaking in during the night, overriding the time lock and taking the money. Now, Mary wasn't prosecuted, but she lost her business. She died in 2018, the year before Alan Bates forced the post office to admit Horizon was desperately flawed. Myra told us this, my mum died not knowing she was right. The Lord Advocate is head of the independent judiciary in Scotland, but she is also the chief legal advisor to the Scottish Government and the Cabinet. So does the First Minister accept that if we follow the position the Lord Advocate laid out to the Scottish Parliament of her preferred process, it will take far too long for postmasters wrongly convicted and some could die before their names are cleared. First Minister. Can I uh, give clarity once again, not just to Douglas Ross, uh, but to Mary's family, to all the other sub-postmasters and sub-postmistresses right across Scotland. Uh, the UK government uh, last week announced that they were looking to bring forward legislation in the UK Parliament in order for mass exonerations to take place when it comes to wrongful convictions. Uh, I have written to the Prime Minister to say we welcome uh, that, uh, progress, that process. And not only that, as the First Minister, that we'd be willing to work with the UK government for that legislation to, be, uh, to take place and have effect on a UK-wide basis. Now, that could be through an LCM. I should say to Douglas Ross, if an LCM, for whatever reason, the UK uh, government, uh, if, the, if, the, if that is not possible, we are already working on contingencies that are in separate Scottish legislation if that is required. I hope not. I think that if there is a possibility for an LCM, uh, that would be uh, the easiest and the quickest route. Uh, I, as the First Minister of Scotland, will decide what legislative route, of course, uh, is brought forward uh, to uh, this Parliament in order to exonerate those who are wrongfully convicted. Let's see once again that harrowing testimony that Douglas Ross has given in relation to what Mary had to suffer, uh, and no doubt the consequences are still felt by her family. That happened on the UK government's watch. Yeah. That happened because of a post office that's wholly reserved to the UK government. And UK government ministers of UK-based parties time after time after time did not believe sub-postmasters and sub-postmistresses like Mary and others who were being harassed by the post office at the time. And, it, and they have waited far too long for justice. And let me give an absolute confirmation and assurance to them that we will work with the UK government and whoever else we need to to make sure there is not a single day longer Briefly, that they First have to Minister. Wait, not just for justice, but for access to compensation. Thank you. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Officer, can I echo the best wishes to King Charles and the Duchess of Rossi and wish them both a speedy recovery? Presiding officer, confusion about the ban of XL dogs in Scotland has brought dangerous dogs back into the headlines. Today, the SNP government will finally make a statement, and I hope they take action. But like so many issues, it is only when media pressure builds that SNP ministers respond. Too often, they act on headlines rather than the evidence. In the last parliament, I sat on the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee when it produced a report on the 2010 Control of Dogs Act. The cross-party committee called for a review of the law and the focus to be on irresponsible owners and breeders. The government accepted the findings of the committee and committed to a review in 2019. So can I ask the First Minister, nearly five years on, why are we still waiting? First Minister. I can I say, of course, there was uh, something that happened between uh, 2020 and, of course, the current uh, time, and that was a global pandemic, which, of course, undoubtedly resulted in the fact that other work had to be delayed. I think most individuals uh, would accept that. In terms of the XL uh, bully uh, uh, safeguards that the UK government have brought in, they, of course, made that announcement without a single uh, word of consultation with the Scottish Government. I suspect if at that point I had said to Anna Sawar that yes, we'll take immediate action, he would have demanded what consultation we had had. So it was right that Siobhan Brown took the time to have consultation with, uh, of course, animal welfare stakeholders, with those who are involved in animal rehoming uh, centres. I should say the Scottish Government still absolutely believes that the correct approach is deed uh, not breed. But we have to also be able to respond to the fact that we've seen media reports of a number of people bringing their XL bully dogs uh, over the border to Scotland. So we have consulted, we have taken time 
uh, to engage, and we will bring forward uh, safeguards. And it should be said, this is not a ban. Of course, people will still be able to have their XL bully dogs if they, of course, uh, meet the criteria of the regulations that are brought forward. But let me say to Anna Sawar, that when it comes uh, to the stricter regime that we have in terms of the Control of Dogs Act, in terms of, uh, of, de uh, in terms of the, the various notices and the stricter regime that we have here in Scotland, I'm pleased that we have a strict regime here in Scotland uh, that isn't available elsewhere in the UK. Anna Sarwar. I know the First Minister is not good in the detail, but the, uh, control of, the review of the Control of Dogs Act was in the programme for government in 2021 ah. <laughs> during COVID. Oh, so I'm not sure yeah. that excuse holds any water. Oh, in, in 2022 alone, victims were treated in Scotland's hospital are reported 7,600 times for injuries inflicted by dogs. These dogs were out of control, often mistreated or poorly trained by their owners. Many of the injuries people sustained disfigured them for life. Kirstine Hobson is a postwoman in Oban. In December, she was brutally attacked by a German shepherd and sustained serious injuries to her face, leg and arm and needed specialist plastic surgery. She'll be scarred for life emotionally and physically. But nothing that the government is announcing today would have helped Kirstine. The government promised five years ago to take action against irresponsible owners and breeders, not just an individual breed. So if the government can act on XL bullies, what will it take for them to protect people like Kirstine and so many others that they have repeatedly promised to do? First Minister. Uh, I think it goes to Kirstine for the injuries uh, that she has suffered. But just to say to Anna Sauer, of course, that we did uh, take action on the back of the work uh, done in 2019. That's why we have uh, a really important regime of dog control uh, notices. That is the regime that I'm talking about that does not exist uh, in England uh, and Wales. And if Anna Sauer had the detail in front of him, he would know that. He would also know, of course, that there are currently more than 1,200 active dog control notices in place in Scotland. Uh, and XL bully dogs, we know, represent 2% uh, of those DCNs that are in force. So one dog attack is, of course, one uh, too many. And we've taken a whole range of actions to protect uh, communities as best we possibly can. And that dog control notice regime that we do have uh, undoubtedly uh, will help in that regard. But we'll continue to work with Police Scotland, with local authorities, with the SSPCA, and indeed other relevant interests to keep communities safe from the very small minority, and we should be clear about that, it's a very small minority of irresponsible dog owners for their dangerous dogs. Anna Sarwar. Prime Minister, 7,600 treatments in hospital related to dog attacks in one single year. I don't think the First Minister should be playing that down because that would be of extreme concern to families across the country. <laughs> Hamza Youssef was, of course, Justice Secretary when this government promised to review the Control of Dogs Act, and still nothing has happened. People like Kirsteen shouldn't have to be fearful when they go to work, and parents shouldn't have to fear for their kids when they take them to the park. This government has a responsibility to protect people, not just respond to bad headlines. But too often, sadly, that is the case. We saw it with the infection scandal at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. We saw it last week and again today with the post office scandal. And now we see it with XL bully dogs. So this government must commit to stronger powers for councils and the police and make it clear that the responsibility for dogs lies with owners and breeders. So does he accept that we can't wait until another 7,000 people are harmed before this government fixes the Control of Dogs Act. First Minister. Can I say to Anna Sawar, his, his third question there took no account of, at all of the response that I gave to his previous question. That is the problem, because Anna Sawar says we failed uh, to act. If he had stopped just reading the pre-prepared script, he would have, of course, heard me say that we brought in a DCN regime, that dog control notice regime that came in, that did not, does not exist in England and Wales, and the fact that we have that in place uh, has meant, of course, that we have more than 1,200 active dog control notices in place uh, as uh, we speak. So we'll continue to work, of course, with Police Scotland, with local authorities, the SSPCA, and other relevant stakeholders to keep our communities safe. We've established, on top of that, an operational working group involving local authorities, Police Scotland, COSLA, and key stakeholders to progress uh, this work. We've also commissioned a national dog control notice database to help enforcement agencies better monitor the control of uh, dogs. When it comes to having to respond to the UK government's actions, and that's what we're having uh, to do 
in this case, wouldn't it be far better that we didn't have to always respond to what the UK government does and instead have the full powers here in Scotland, presiding officer? Question number three, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that Scotland has among the worst survival rates for some of the most serious cancers. First Minister. Cancer remains a national priority for the NHS and the Scottish Government, which is why we published a 10-year strategy in June 2023 focused on improving cancer survival and providing equitable access to treatment. It includes a focus on the less survivable cancers and improving their outcomes. The strategy and the plan take a comprehensive approach to improving patient pathways in cancer from prevention and diagnosis right the way through to treatment and, of course, post-treatment uh, care. I'm very heartened by the fact that overall cancer mortality in Scotland has decreased by 11% over the last 10 years, but we recognise, of course, we have much more to do, particularly when it comes to less survivable cancers. And I can I put on record the fact that I know Alexander Stewart has raised these issues on a number of occasions and the importance uh, uh, that he attaches uh, to this is shared by the government too. Alexander Stewart. I thank the First Minister for that response. The SNP government have been responsible for running health for nearly 17 years. Data shows that out of 33 countries of comparable wealth and income levels, Scotland ranks as low as 32nd for a five-year survival from pancreatic cancer, 31st for stomach cancer and 29th for lung cancer. First Minister, you should be ashamed that your government has allowed the five-year survival rates for these cancers to deteriorate to some of the lowest in the developed world. And what action will you take to resolve this? Always through the chair, please, First Minister. Uh, when, when uh, of course, uh, there are uh, those type of uh, rates and survival rates, uh, then there is work for the Scottish Government to do. There's no getting away from that. I have spoken often about uh, my own uh, personal uh, experience in relation to, to pancreatic cancer. I've lost an uncle, a dear uncle, uh, to pancreatic cancer. So it's an issue that's very personal uh, to me. Uh, I should say, of course, there are areas uh, where we compare very favourably to those 33 countries in terms of liver uh, cancer, for example, survival rate. Scotland is 12th, uh, whereas the UK overall is 21, England uh, 25th place. So there are uh, other cancer types where we're, where we're seeing progress, but clearly in other uh, areas such as pancreatic cancer, uh, stomach cancer, uh, brain cancer, lung cancer, there's still uh, much more for us to do in relation to what we are doing. I'll make sure the Cabinet Secretary for Health uh, writes in detail uh, to Alexander Stewart. But what we are doing is trying to speed up diagnosis where we can. Uh, and that's why we're investing in our Detect Cancer Early uh, programme, but also uh, investing in the rapid cancer diagnostic uh, services, which are currently operational in five NHS boards across Scotland. And uh, the early evaluation uh, from those rapid cancer diagnosis, diagnosis services do show uh, that HPB, liver and pancreatic cancers, are amongst the most common cancers that are being diagnosed uh, through that pathway. So uh, overall, of course, as I, I go back to this point and end in this point, presiding officer, the overall cancer mortality in Scotland has decreased by 11% over the last 10 years, but less survivable cancers, as Alexander Stewart says, there is clearly still work uh, to do. David Torrance. Thank you, presiding officer. While Labour MSPs shamefully failed to support minimum unit pricing, a policy which has proven to save lives and reduce hospital administrations since its inception, what assessment has the Scottish Government made on the impact of policies like minimum unit pricing on liver cancer rates in Scotland? First Minister. Well, Public Health Scotland evaluation of uh, minimum unit pricing shows that MUP has had a very positive impact on health outcomes uh, during the study period. It's estimated to have cut alcohol consumption, alcohol attributable deaths, and likely to have reduced hospital admissions. Uh, Public Health Scotland estimates that about half of liver cancers are preventable in the UK, and that's why we continue to, to take action, uh, to, to take action uh, on, on, on the most prevalent factors, particularly, of course, including alcohol consumption. Uh, prevention of cancers uh, takes longer to realise, but we would be hopeful that MUP impacts will be seen in the future for liver cancers. Our cancer strategy does place a focus on less survivable cancers, including, of course, liver cancer as well. Jackie Bailey. I recently met with a courageous group of women from the west of Scotland who shared their experience of being diagnosed with ovarian cancer and being forced to use their family's life savings to fund private treatment in England. According to target ovarian cancer, those in the west of Scotland cannot access life-saving surgery that women in NHS Lothian can access. 
Consequently, they face poorer outcomes when it comes to survival rates for the disease. It is nothing short of a national scandal that women with ovarian cancer are having to pay for the surgery they need and deserve because of where they live. Can the First Minister tell us why women in the west of Scotland can't get surgery and what urgent action is being taken to end this life-threatening postcode lottery? First Minister. Well, again, I'm happy uh, to ensure that the Cabinet Secretary for Health writes uh, in detail uh, to Jackie Bailey about what actions are being uh, taken. I don't want anybody uh, in the country, regardless of what their condition is, but particularly when it is cancer, to have to wait uh, a day longer than they have to in order to get treatment. We know the earlier that, that cancer is diagnosed, the earlier that treatment begins, then the better chances in relation uh, to survival. And that's why we've taken action to increase the number of consultant oncologists, for example. There's been almost a 100% increase uh, since the SNP uh, has been in position. Uh, we've increased the consultant radiologists by uh, over 66% uh, uh, as well. In terms of uh, private health care, again, uh, when Scotland is compared to the rest of the UK, uh, we see fewer people having to self-fund for any private uh, inpatient uh, day case uh, care. Notwithstanding all of that, of course, uh, the work that we are doing in order, particularly on ovarian cancer, uh, is one that I want to see extended right across Scotland uh, so that there is not a postcode lottery of care. And I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary for Health writes in detail to Ms Bailey. Question number four, Emma Harper. To ask the First Minister, in light of reported concerns regarding food labelling being a devolved matter, what the Scottish Government's position is and what impact the UK Government's reported plans to roll out not for EU labelling on food and drink products across the whole of the UK could have on Scotland's food and drink industry. First Minister. The Government shares the well-documented concerns that Food and Drink Federation Scotland, many food and drink businesses, have highlighted about these labelling plans. The Rural Affairs uh, Secretary, Mary Goujon, wrote to our UK government counterpart before Christmas for much needed clarification on their plans. However, my understanding is she's not had the courtesy of a response yet. However, we will continue to press the UK government for answers, not least to the questions of why they're insisting on pursuing a policy that would arbitrarily add costs to all agri-food businesses, not just those who trade specifically with Northern Ireland. This is a move which is disproportionate, it's wholly inappropriate, particularly when consumers are already bearing the burden of added food costs. It's just another example, frankly, of conservative chaos harming our economy. Emma Harper. Thank the First Minister for that response. I agree with the First Minister about the impact and the harm that this will cause many Scottish food and drink businesses. Would the First Minister also agree that while this might be needed for goods being traded with Northern Ireland, there is no rationale for it for, uh, for other trade? Has, has the Westminster Government shared why it intends to impose this regime? First Minister. No, they haven't. Uh, we've, uh, again, written to them, but of course we've not had the courtesy of a response. There's not any real evidence or convincing argument for why this labelling requirement is necessary. And of course, those in food and drink, uh, those food and drink stakeholders uh, in Scotland have added so much to our economy are absolutely scathing uh, about the UK government's plans. The Food and Drink Federation Director for Growth, Bawanda Dut, says, and I quote, our members are really clear that the government's plan to extend not for EU product labelling on a UK-wide basis will hamper growth, hitting investment, exports and jobs, while increasing consumer prices and restricting the choice of products. The evidence is clear. The independent analysis is clear that Brexit is damaging our economy. And that's why it's utterly unforgivable that not a single UK-based party is standing up against Brexit or even pr proposing that we rejoin the single market, a market seven times the size of the UK. And the people of Scotland should be given that choice. Do they want to stay in broken Brexit Britain? Briefly, or do they want Minister. to make decisions for ourselves as an independent nation in the European Union? <clears throat> Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, presiding officer. The UK government will launch a consultation on a new food labelling scheme, which will ensure that consumers know what they are buying. They're buying high quality British produce over imported goods that don't meet UK welfare standards. Does the First Minister support this move and can he explain how he expects Scottish farmers and fishermen to continue to provide high welfare and environmental standard food when his SNP budget is cutting 46 million from the rural affairs portfolio? First Minister. Another Brexit burden for businesses in Scotland to have to bear, even though, of course, we didn't vote for Brexit. But the damage, Let's hear the, first the burdens 
of Brexit are being imposed upon our businesses up and down Scotland. So I don't think businesses are lining up to thank Rachel Hamilton's no. Conservatives for the imposition of Brexit. Quite the opposite. We have, of course, even the British Retail Consortium uh, saying that given labelling is intended to prevent goods from GB entering the EU through Northern Ireland, it's unclear why such labelling is necessary for all goods sold in Great Britain. This will only add unnecessary costs at a time when the cost of living is already so high. So the SNP is the only party that's standing up against Brexit, the only party that says we should be rejoining the European Union, rejoining, of course, that single, that, 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 that single market that is seven times the size of the UK market. When the choice is so clear, presiding officer, it's no wonder the Conservatives fear the verdict of the Scottish people. Question number five, Douglas Lumsden. Uh, to ask the First Minister what percentage of the premises contracted for delivery of superfast broadband under the R100 scheme have still to be connected? First Minister. All homes and businesses across Scotland can currently access a superfast broadband service. The R100 contracts are going beyond that by extending access to gigabit capable broadband that's over 30 times faster than our, our, our original commitment. Our programme does remain on track to complete build and ensure all contracted premises are connected by 2028. So far, over 36,100 premises have been connected and the remainder will be phased between now uh, and 2028. The Scottish Government has prioritised investment in digital connectivity in the 24-25 budget, uh, despite, of course, uh, swinging cuts from the UK Government, recognising, of course, that uh, digital connectivity is a key building block for a green and growing economy. Dr Swamston. Um, First Minister, the R100 scheme was meant to connect over 114,000 premises, mainly in our rural areas, by 2021. Mm, yep. From a Freedom of Information request, we know that only 29% of these premises have been connected, and the figures in the north are even worse, with only 15% delivered. And the scheme for North Scotland has slipped to 2028, seven years late. So does the First Minister accept that this abject failure by his government is leaving our rural communities behind? And will the R100 scheme be delayed any further? First Minister. Well, first of all, uh, President Officer, we do have a, a strong uh, track record of delivering successful digital infrastructure. Our broadband initiatives Members. have delivered almost one million connections to date. But for Douglas Lumd Lumsden to ask about telecoms, when telecoms is wholly reserved to the UK government, well, you couldn't mark his neck with a blowtorch, presiding officer, because we have a strong track record. We have invested, in fact, when it comes to rural Scotland, we've invested three times more in the R100 North contract than we have in the Central or South contract. So any suggestion that the North of Scotland has been neglected is simply untrue. But despite the fact that telecoms legislation is wholly reserved to Westminster. The UK government has invested just 49.4 million of the R100 programme. This stands in stark contrast to the 592 million pounds that the Scottish government has invested. Presiding officer, if we left it to the UK government, uh, we would all be using dial-up modems, presiding officer. So, so thank God and thank goodness for the SNP Briefly, stepping First in. Minister. And through our efforts, of course, we've delivered over one million broadband connections to Scotland Thank today. you. We must move on. And I call Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister may recall media coverage of the eye-watering quote of £725,000 given to Shetland residents to get connected to superfast broadband. The broadband voucher scheme, even when pooled with neighbours, wouldn't have covered the cost. Another constituent's investigating the possibility of a community scheme, but finds that inflation has impacted the scheme's real terms value. Is it time for a rethink of the current voucher scheme offer? First Minister. I'm happy to look at the important issue that Beatrice uh, Wishart does uh, raise. We have had some success uh, when it comes to our R100 programme uh, on a number of our islands, and sometimes our, our most uh, remote islands. Uh, I know, of course, uh, uh, Beatrice Wishart is asking me about Shetland in particular, but when it comes to our contract build uh, on Fair Isle, uh, it was delivered almost two years ahead of schedule uh, in one of the country's most challenging uh, rural uh, locations. What I would say to Beatrice Wishart is the issues that she raised 
uh, are important, of course, if there are tweaks that we can make, understanding particularly uh, the complexities in our island communities, then we're always happy to consider that. Question number six, Evelyn Tweed. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that information on sexually transmitted infections is accessible in light of STIQ Day and the reported rising number of cases of sexually transmitted infections in Scotland. First Minister. Ensuring that uh, people have access to the information and services they need uh, to make informed choices and to take care of their sexual health is absolutely vital, which is why uh, there are outcomes in our Sexual Health and Bloodborne Virus Action Plan. Uh, the plan that was published in November just last year sets out the priority areas for action over the next three years and is backed by £1.7 million of government funding. The Scottish Government is funding a number of projects to support these priorities, including the development of a new sexual health website hosted by NHS Inform and production of accessible uh, animated information resources on key sexual health topics, including STI testing in a range of community languages. Vaccinations against STIs also continue to be important in the protection of treatment uh, and disease. Evelyn Tweed. Research published by the BMJ last year found that young people in rural and island communities face practical and social barriers to support for sexual wellbeing. Can the First Minister outline what steps the Scottish Government is taking to ensure access to timely STI testing in these areas? First Minister. Well, that's a really important point that Evelyn uh, Tweed uh, rightly raises around the particular complexities and nuances that our rural communities face in relation to sexual health uh, care. Uh, and, and rural communities do face very unique challenges when it comes to accessing health care. Sexual health is no different uh, to that. And that's why, of course, we, we don't uh, believe that one size uh, fits all when it comes to delivering health care in particular. So NHS boards, they're the experts on their communities, which is why we work with boards to ensure appropriate tailored approaches that are very suitable to local needs. And there's a number of projects that we have invested uh, through our sexual health uh, and BBV plan, action plan, which include a, a, a significant focus on rural communities. These include, for example, uh, outreach services in Ayrshire and Arran, and exploring the delivery of HIV pre-exposure uh, prophylaxis and primary care in Grampian. Carol Mockin. Thank you, President Officer. Given the importance the First Minister places on this issue, can I ask the First Minister to acknowledge that there are often limited access to in-person sexual health services, particularly, as was mentioned, in rural areas. Even in more urban areas, clinic times can be limited to one session per week, and NHS Inform indicates workforce pressures are causing operational hours to be changeable. Given all of this, can I ask the First Minister what additional investment has been made in sexual health services to ensure face-to-face -face appointments can be uh, provided appropriately when requested? First Minister. And I think the, the point we made uh, by the member is very important uh, indeed. And, and of course, uh, there will be a number of people who want that face-to-face -face service. There will be a number of people who don't want that face-to-face -face service. And uh, we should say, uh, all of us, I'm sure, collectively, that there is no stigma in relation to sexual health. People should be able to access the care they want when they want it, uh, and however they want it, be it face-to-face -face, uh, or indeed uh, otherwise. In terms of uh, the funding that we're providing, uh, I've mentioned the action plan. It's backed by £1.7 million of funding to improve sexual health and bloodborne virus outcomes. Uh, grants totalling 800,000 have been distributed between a whole wide range of, of projects, uh, including high quality innovative projects with health boards, third sector organisations and academia. Many of them provide that face-to-face -face service that Carol Mockin rightly uh, raises in terms of wider uh, funding for the health service. Of course, I'm very pleased that notwithstanding uh, the, the fact that we have swinging cuts from the UK government in terms of our budget, uh, we've increased our uh, investment in the NHS uh, to a record 19.5 billion. Move to general and constituency supplementaries, and I call Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. The first minister will be aware of the McClure solicitors' collapse, which happened in 2021, leaving an estimated 100,000 people affected UK wide. The firm were a agreement-based company with many clients locally. The Trust and Succession Scotland Bill passed in December, and the current regulation of Legal Services Scotland Bill will hopefully make similar situations in the future more manageable. However, would the First Minister provide an assurance that the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission will be supported, if they require it, to deal with the expected increase in complaints relating to McClure's as former clients become aware of the collapse and as public information events take place similar to the one hosted at the Beacon in Greenock with the SLCC earlier this week, which was attended by 150 people? First Minister. 
Uh, yes, I'm hopeful that the SLCC will be appropriately funded, and I'll come to that point uh, very shortly. I'm aware uh, of this matter. I appreciate, uh, as Stuart McMillan has rightly said, the distress that this uh, continues to cause. And I can't obviously comment on individual cases. The Scottish Government has taken uh, proactive steps to mitigate against such a situation mm -hmm. in the future. And Stuart McMillan, again, is right uh, to raise the issue of the regulation of Legal Services Scotland Bill uh, introduces authorisation of legal businesses, bringing benefits such as greater consistency in regulating legal firms, enabling the regulator to identify and address deficiencies early doors. Uh, I understand the concerns which the member does raise. Uh, the SLCC, in terms of funding, uh, is funded by a levy paid by legal professions in Scotland. And the SLCC uh, require to forecast trends and complaints when considering their budget in order to set the levy. So any proposed levy does take into account the consideration of potentially increases in complaints, uh, such as complaints relating to the matter uh, that has been raised. Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Early this week, I attended a protest against East Dunbartonshire Council's plans to close the Milan Daycare Centre. Milan provides a fantastic tailored service to elderly and vulnerable ethnic minority clients. Its service users are all say that Milan should be a model for the rest of Scotland to follow, rather than something to be closed down. Can I ask the First Minister, does he agree that local services should cater to all communities, including the needs of ethnic minorities? And what can the Scottish Government do to save Milan and other centres like that? Minister. I thank uh, Pam Gosel for raising the issue of the Milan Centre. Uh, just this week, uh, yesterday in fact, I met with the Scottish Hindu, Hindu uh, Foundation, a recently established uh, organisation uh, speaking on behalf of the Hindu community, and they raised the issue of the Milan Centre to me, and I said, of course, that we would engage uh, with the local uh, authority uh, in this uh, case, Eastern Bartonshire, in order to see what more we could do uh, and, and in order to assist. But of course, these are decisions that are being made by local authorities. And that is why, of course, when the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Finance, Deputy First Minister, announced our budget, she announced an uplift uh, for uh, local uh, government. So I do agree that community services uh, are, of course, incredibly important. They should cater to the needs of all of our diverse uh, communities. What doesn't help, of course, is that we continue to receive uh, a £500 million cut in our block grant uh, since 22-23. But despite those swinging cuts, we have decided to prioritise local government by giving them an uplift in 24-25. Pauline McNeill. Turning point 218 in Glasgow will close in February. The city, Glasgow City Council presented the service with an unworkable budget of 650,000 down from 1.5 million. But the funding was previously ring-fenced by the Scottish Government, who signed off a reduction in this funding in a letter on the 31st of May last year. And this decision has effectively resulted in the closure of the service. Is the First Minister content that there is now no bed facility for women offenders with drug use as the main problem which has kept hundreds of women out of jail? The Lullia Centre in Maryhill, which is brilliant, cited by the Cabinet Secretary in her response, is not an alternative to custody disposal. Ministers surely cannot wash their hands of this tragic outcome. First Minister. I, I know the 218 uh, project well. I've visited the 218 project uh, in the past uh, when, I, when I was on the Justice uh, Committee many, many years ago. And it's a project that I know is doing some excellent work. This is, of course, a decision uh, made by Glasgow uh, City Council in relation to the services that they're able uh, to fund. I am more than happy, of course, uh, to ask uh, the Justice uh, Secretary uh, to engage uh, with Greater Glasgow, uh, with uh, uh, Glasgow City Council on this particular issue, because I know the excellent work that Turning Point 218 uh, has done over the years. Uh, we know, of course, by giving that really intensive support uh, to female offenders, we can stop that cycle of reoffending. So, as a project uh, that uh, I know of uh, and that I value uh, very, very highly, of course, we have uh, maintained uh, our budget in relation uh, to the national mission on dealing with uh, drugs deaths in particular. But this government, uh, nobody should be in any doubt, believes in community justice uh, disposals. And that's why I'll ask the appropriate Cabinet Secretary uh, to pick this issue up with Glasgow City Council. Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Officer. Good morning. It was sad to hear that Marks and Spencers have decided to close 
their Aberdeen St Nicholas Street store, a, a blow that has been lessened by the fact that they intend to invest and expand at Union Square in Aberdeen. However, uh, the site of uh, St Nicholas Street on Union Street is a very important one. And I've asked uh, the local authority and other stakeholders to come together to form a task force to ensure that we can uh, have a bright future for that site and Union Street as a whole. The First Minister has previously ensured investment in the, our Union Street project to help uh, with regeneration of Aberdeen City Centre. Can I ask him uh, if the government would serve in such a task force if it is, uh, comes to fruition? Uh, and I hope uh, that he will agree to do so. First Minister. I'll be certainly uh, happy to give that uh, consideration. Uh, as the member has already rightly said, of course, uh, we value our city centres, our town centres, and we are working hard to make sure that they are as vibrant as mm -hmm. possible. Flourishing and vibrant city centres very, is essential, in fact, for the social and economic well-being uh, of our cities and of Aberdeen as well, of course. That's why we provided, as the member said, £400,000 to the community-led Aberdeen Our Union Street initiative which aims to revitalise the town centre building of the city centre's regeneration plans. But if uh, Kevin Stewart can furnish uh, me with the details of the task force that he is proposing, uh, then of course we will give that due consideration. And Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, four months have passed since the Scottish Government announced a full public inquiry into Professor El Jamel, but we still have no confirmation of the appointed chair, no confirmation of the start date of the one-to-one -one clinical reviews, and as revealed by the Courier newspaper, no confirmation from you as First Minister that the public inquiry will start in 2024. So can I ask the First Minister for confirmation on all these points? First Minister. Yes, it's fully my uh, expectation, of course, that the uh, public inquiry starts in uh, 2024. And by that, of course, uh, we should have a, a, a judge uh, appointed, an inquiry chair appointed, uh, very shortly, I would hope, because the Lord Pro President rightly has been involved in the process of appointing an inquiry chair and discussions, I can say, are at a very advanced stage. Uh, planning for the independent clinical review is also well underway and further discussions are continuing early uh, next week. Uh, we'll see more as soon as we can, uh, as with the announcement of the inquiry, we'll ensure that former patients are informed directly uh, wherever uh, possible. But I would like to say to those who have suffered greatly at the hands of Professor uh, L. Uh, Jamel. We don't want them waiting a moment longer in order for the public inquiry uh, to begin and, uh, and give them uh, absolute confidence that there is a lot of work happening uh, somewhat behind the scenes at the moment uh, with the appropriate authorities, including the Lord uh, President, to ensure that an appropriate inquiry chair is appointed. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Ruth McGuire, and there will now be a short suspension to allow those leaving the chamber and public gallery to do so.